So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, Dobro dan, or how do you say it? Is it correct? Huh? Sort no? ah, okay, sort of, okay. So, uh, how are you feeling? At almost the end of the, conf of the conference? Uh, are you still holding up? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's have a short talk, 35 minutes about, uh, well, theoretically microservices, but more specific, an API gateway. And what we'll aim to do here is try to understand exactly, okay, w where in a microservice architecture fits this idea of an API gateway and why it is important or what are the features uh, that an API gateway should have. And of course, then I will show you a, a library that, that we can already use that is also uh, uh, backed by Microsoft that really does everything for us and it makes life very, very easy for us uh, as developers. And this library is called uh, Oslot. But before we get started, just a few words about me. I'm uh, currently a software developer at a small company in Romania. It's called uh, Amdaris, but I'm also co-founder of, of my own company, which is called Code Wrinkles. This is mostly a platform to deliver online trainings, live online trainings, for people who want to become software developers. And I wanted to do that because myself, I didn't study computer science at all. I studied philosophy and theology. Uh, so I learned a lot of things by my own, and now I feel that it's time to give something back, so that's why I started this, uh, this whole project. And I'm also, uh, well, engaged in different uh, uh, conferences, and one of them in, in Romania, in Cluj, Apex Vox, is a conference that I'm co-organizing uh, with uh, another friend of mine. It's something like the .NET Summit, but it was the first edition this year, so I would say a smaller brother or sister of .NET Summit. Uh, okay. Uh, let's get started. What we want to, uh, to look at right now, it's okay. Let's have a short overview on what microservices is. Uh, we won't really dive deep into it. We just we look at the picture and try to understand uh, how microservices work. And then just to be on the same page from the API gateway uh, perspective. Uh, and then we'll uh, try to understand exactly, okay, what is the idea, the role, the purpose of an API gateway. Uh, what should be the features of such an a API gateway, and then we look at Oslot and how we can configure it, uh, how it does work, and so on. And we'll also look into some code and demos, of course. So let's get started. Uh, a lot of session, uh, a, a, a lot of sessions during this conference were basically around microservices, more or less like the GraphQL, like we had also from Alex Thyssen with Hellchecks and so on. So there are, were a lot of sessions that were uh, well. Uh, mainly or uh, kind of were in this idea of microservices. And this is another one. But what I want to do here is just to offer another perspective on how we can handle the gateway, the door to your services. So just uh, to have a brief overview, when we talk about microservices, we usually think about a certain type of architecture where a lot of our functionalities is basically split in different small services. Uh, and this service is very specialized to do only one very important thing and do it well. So as we see here, we have a service, uh, a red service, a yellow, a green, and so on. And the idea is that, okay, uh, these services do their job, but of course, the whole, the whole idea of, of, of our service is to be consumed by somebody. So uh, if we need some clients, or if there are clients that want to consume our services, uh, how can they do it? Should they call each service? Do I need products? I call this service. Do I need users? I call this service. Uh, do I need, I don't know, uh, uh, product details, as you s so, uh, said in your talk, then I should call the other service and so on. Uh, and of, of course, this is really not optimal. And that's uh, why, in fact, we need, this mic is not working correctly. Uh, that's why, in fact, we need an API gateway. Because the API gateway should be basically the door to our e ecosystem, let's say. Um, good. So uh, why do we need this uh, API gateway? And there is basically one very important point about it. Uh, and from it, there are other things that derive, I would say. For, for first and foremost, an API gateway is basically a unified entry point to our system. And this, of course, brings a lot of different advantages. First of all, clients can communicate only using this gateway with the entire system. 
So they don't have to remember the IP address, the host name, or whatever for each service in part. They just have to remember uh, the IP address or the host name or whatever of the API gateway. And the API gateway will be then responsible to find out exactly, OK, this consumer wants to, I don't know, get a certain information, which service should be responsible, uh, let's say, to fulfill that request. So the API gateway should do that. And uh, since we have this central point in our system, which is the API gateway, uh, this means that we can also enforce some uh, policies at a central level, for instance. Uh, and this means for, uh, that we could maybe enforce authorization, uh, we can enforce different uh, error handling policies, and so on. Uh, but what we could also do is uh, aggregate responses from different services. And how many of you did attend the GraphQL talk of Michael? Okay, oh, a lot of, cool. So basically what he said there was very cool, I really liked it. Uh, but what I want to, uh, to tell you now is that we have also a REST way of aggregating or stitching schemas, uh, as he said. And this is what is called in OSLET response uh, aggregation. And what this actually means is basically that, okay, I make a request, uh, and to fulfill that request, maybe I need information from different services. Then we can configure this in the API gateway, and the API gateway will be then responsible to fetch the information that it needs from each of the services, uh, and then create the response and send it back to the consumer. So the consumer would not uh, need to make three different calls to get the information that it needs. It only uh, can make one call, and this should be enough. So this is uh, also very, very important. And then we have also, for instance, centralized caching. We can implement there at the API gateway level. So as a summary, what should an API gateway do? First and foremost, it should proxy requests. This is, I would say, the most important role of the gateway. So a request comes in, the gateway says, hello request, OK. Uh, what do you want? Do you need users, products, uh, catalogs, whatever? Then the gateway should call the specific service and say, hey, I have a, a request that needs, I don't know, a few users. So the service provides the user, and the gateway basically sends uh, the response back. A gateway for more advanced scenarios where we uh, deploy our services, I don't know, maybe in uh, Kubernetes clusters or using uh, Azure uh, app services and so on, uh, the API gateway should also be able to perform service discovery. Uh, what does this mean? It means that, okay, when a request comes in, maybe we cannot define from the beginning the reroutes, and we will see exactly what reroutes are, uh, because things might change when we have our microservices deployed in, uh, in uh, that way. So in this case, uh, we can configure, or a gateway should be able to be configurable to get the information or to discover, to know exactly where to look for a certain service when it needs it. Then there is another very important point that an API gateway should do, which is header transformation. And that is really, really important, because uh, if all requests come through the gateway, and in the gateway we enforce some central policies and authorization, authentication, and so on, this would, of course, mean that uh, the gateway should uh, send also to the services some basic information about, OK, what happened at the gateway level. Was the authorization successful, and so on. And uh, in a lot of cases, headers are a very good place to put some information so that services can consume it uh, and know exactly, uh, well, uh, what happened and where, and what, uh, well, what happened when the request initially arrived uh, to the gateway. Uh, then, of course, the gateway should be able to load balance requests. Uh, it should be able to do uh, authorization, of course. And it should be also able to implement rate limiting, or also called throttling. Because, well, uh, we don't want uh, well, to have our services uh, abused. So uh, the good news is that, OK, it sounded like a lot of things that we would need to do. But in fact, there is this great library, which is called Oslot. Uh, and this library basically uh, implemented or created an API gateway. And the very cool thing is that we see here there are a lot of features that, that, that we talked about. And everything that is mentioned here is something that Oslot can do, and even more than that. So 
if when we think about all these things that we mentioned here, we would imagine, or at least I uh, was imagining, uh, okay, uh, probably I will need to do a lot of coding there. But the good part is that uh, basically with, uh, with Oslot, uh, well, uh, in simple or medium complex scenarios, you basically just don't have to write any code at all. Because most of the things that, that we do or, uh, in, in Oslot, we configure it via a JSON file. And uh, we will look uh, into it just uh, in a minute. So just to ramp up, what Oslot does, uh, among other things, it uh, aggregates requests or responses, sorry. Uh, this means that basically, as said, when a request comes in, if it needs more information from different services, Oslot can get it. Uh, it can do authentication and authorization. It can do header transformation. It can do rate limiting. It can do caching, service discovery. And it's very easy to integrate with uh, Kubernetes or ser uh, service fabric. And what I really like about Oslo that I discovered only, well, a few months after I started to work with it, is that it's basically also easy to extend. And uh, how? Well, Oslot, as we will see, is not, uh, it is nothing else that, than a bunch of middleware through which all requests go, uh, uh, go, and then responses go also through that pipeline once again when they uh, are sent out. And the idea is that we can, at any time, place our own middleware there before the Oslot middleware. So we can uh, do our own logic on each request. But uh, if we need even more specific uh, customizations that we would need to do for each request or response or whatever, uh, then we can do some more very interesting uh, tricks. And uh, how many of you did attend uh, the previous session, Steve Gordon's on HTTP client factory? And at a certain point, he talked about delegating handlers, yeah? You remember that? Now, you can create your own delegating handlers and add them to the uh, HTTP client that Oslot basically creates. So this means that besides the configuration that you can do by yourself only in a JSON file, basically this means that, uh, well, you could extend the functionality with whatever logic you need it. And this is, from, from my point of view at least, very, very powerful. So now let's look a little bit on how uh, Oslot uh, works basically under the hood. Let's imagine that we have here some services, like service one, two, three, and four. And we have, of course, a request that comes in, and a, at a certain time, there, re, there will be a response. Now, the request, uh, it hits, of course, the API gateway. And what it basically does is that all slots consist, as said, of a bunch of middleware. And the, each request is then sent through each middleware uh, for, uh, that, that all slots provides. And we'll see exactly that depending on the configuration that, that we make or the features that we want to add, basically more and more middlewares are added to this pipeline. The whole idea of, of this passage of each request from one middleware to another is to take the request, to look at the configuration, and make the request look exactly like it is described in the configuration file. And when this happens, uh, the request then uh, arrives at uh, what it is called this request handler middleware or request builder middleware. And this is the last Oslot middleware in the pipeline. The importance of, uh, of this middleware is as follows. Because what happens here is that what Oslot actually does, it creates, well, a clone, let's say, of, of the request that, that came in and sends that request to the service. Then the service sends the response and then this uh, middleware generates the response to that request that, that was initially coming in and sends it again backwards through the middleware pipeline until the response then uh, gets sent to the consumer. So this is basically, uh, well, uh, a very high overview of the design of, uh, of Oslot. So now let's look uh, at the features. This tablet is not displaying the time anymore, by the way. Um, OK, let's look at, uh, at very few features uh, of Oslot, which are very, very important. And the first one is the configuration. How do we configure Oslot? And the configuration, theoretically, is very, very easy. Because as said, we just configured via JSON. And uh, there is a file which needs to be called oslot.json for now. It's like that uh, uh, in Oslot. And it basically uh, has two JSON objects, a reroutes array which contains uh, an array of, of reroutes, and we will see in just a second what reroutes are. 
and a, a global configuration object where you can configure some global configurations like the base URL, service discovery if you need, a console if you want to store this uh, uh, configuration in, in some other places and so on. Uh, so things that are globally for, for all or for the entire infrastructure are usually done in this global configuration, but most of the features that, that we'll be using are usually in the reroute. And theoretically, as I said, uh, this JSON document seems to be v v very, very easy, but it can get even messier because all slots has, I don't know, more than 50 different features, which means that basically for each feature we would have uh, something like a JSON property or array here uh, uh, to define. So of course that with as many or, uh, new features that we want to add to our gateway, also the configuration file or the complexity of the configuration file will grow. Uh, and eventually, if you want to use really all features that are in all slots right now, well, it doesn't fit even on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, there are really a lot of them. Uh, r basically, this here, you will also get the slides and you can take a look, but it's also on the, on the Oslo uh, documentation page, uh, which will be shared with you. Uh, these are basically all the Oslot configuration options that we have right now or that Oslot supports right now. Good. Then, the next very, very important thing, and regarding the configuration, you have to imagine the Oslot configuration really something like the uh, appsetics.json file in, in uh, ASP.NET Core. Ah, and by the way, Oslot basically is built on ASP.NET Core, so you cannot use Oslot without uh, ASP.NET Core. Um, good. Let's, uh, let's go now to the routing part. As said, routing uh, is defined in Oslot uh, based in what it is called a reroute. And as said in this configuration, we have um, an array of reroutes. So basically for each service that we have, we have or we need to define a reroute in this oslot.json file. And in this reroute, there are uh, very uh, few important things that we have to pay uh, attention. First of all, uh, I, I know it's, it's not very, very, very visible, uh, but we have uh, something like an upstream path template. Uh, the upstream, every time you hear talking about upstream in Oslot, it means uh, the endpoint of the API gateway to which a request comes in. The downstream path template basically defines or describes uh, the URL, the URI, where uh, Oslot needs to make the call to get that specific information. So once again, upstream path is uh, the URL that, uh, that clients um, use to call the API gateways, and the downstream path is uh, the resource that the API needs to call to fulfill that request. Uh, and basically, uh, for each upstream path template, you would have to define a downstream path template, uh, which, uh, of course, is, uh, is the service itself. The cool thing about downstream path templates is that it has, at a certain point, uh, these uh, downstream uh, host and ports, where you basically can configure uh, or what is the port er, and what is the host to which also should do the request with this path template. And here this is an array. So you can provide more uh, such uh, host and ports. Uh, and this is something that you usually do when you have a microservices architecture. A service usually runs maybe in different places. So you can simply list them here. And then you can also configure, uh, as said, uh, load balancing. So Oslot will then use, depending on what you set as, as load balancing policies, will use one um, of the host and ports mentioned here in, uh, in the host and ports um, array. Then uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, basically for each reroute, these are the two things that are very important. The upstream path template, the upstream path method, uh, the downstream path template and uh, the downstream path uh, method and the host and ports. This is really all the configuration that we need for a request to be sent. Uh, everything else is basically on top of that, is configuration that we can add, functionality that we can add to each request that will be sent uh, to our services. So do we want to add uh, authentication? No problem, we can do that. 
do we want to add low ba load balancing no problem we can do that as well but at a minimum we need to have this upstream path templates and uh, uh, downstream path templates and host and ports defined for uh, for uh, Oslo to, to work good uh, authentication and uh, authorization this is also uh, very important because Oslo uh, is very easy to be integrated with providers like uh, Identity Server or Out0 or uh, even uh, Okta, but you can even uh, create your own identity providers and uh, use them. In fact, in the demo, I created uh, my own, let's say, uh, identity provider. Uh, and it, the idea is that uh, once you configure authentication and authorization, then you have to define uh, at each reroute if authentication and authorization should be applied or not. And this is very, very important because you might have a reroute that you want necessarily or where you don't want to enforce authorization. Maybe if you expose, I don't know, an endpoint that is actually giving you a token. So you cannot put that endpoint uh, under uh, authorization. So in that case, you might want to have some, uh, s some endpoints that you exclude from authorization. No problem in all sorts, you simply don't, uh, don't add the authorization configuration to that specific reroute. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you can just simply add and configure uh, authentication in startup.cs, and then, uh, sorry that it, it's re not really visible here, but you can add that uh, basically at uh, each reroute. We'll see this also uh, in the demo. Then the next thing that you can do is header transformation. So uh, basically when a request comes in, Oslot can uh, do a lot of things uh, and it can also add headers to that request. Uh, and one scenario that for instance we were using on the project that uh, I am working on is that we take for instance some claims from the tokens that, that we receive in the headers and we put them as headers when that request is sent to the downstream service. Because the downstream service may need to know, okay, what user is it, to which company does, does that user belong, and so on. Uh, but you can also add custom headers. Uh, you can, uh, well, uh, remove headers. You can uh, change headers. So you can perform any type of operation on the headers uh, that you want. And everything is, config is, uh, is configurable in this uh, Oslo.json file for each reroute itself. So let's now take a look at... Uh, at Oslot. Okay, what do we have here? So this is uh, the Oslot file. Uh, this is the API gateway. And here we have, uh, it, it's a normal ASP.NET Core application. Uh, the only thing is that we installed uh, uh, the Oslot library via NuGet. Uh, and in program.cs, uh, well, in this case, I put all the configuration uh, here because, uh, well, it's, I didn't want to use also the, the startup for that. Okay, sorry that I cannot. Um, okay, my hands are wet and not working well. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the normal program.cs uh, where, in this case, we, we build our, our host here. Uh, we can co configure uh, the web host builder with everything that we need. And in our case, basically, uh, what we want to do is, uh, here we add uh, the, the authentication. B basically, here is where we describe to Oslot or to ASP.NET Core uh, how it should validate uh, incoming tokens. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is then basically when we, can, we, when we configure the, mi the middleware pipeline of, of, the of this application, we simply use this use all slot and this use all slot adds basically all the needed middleware uh, from all slot to uh, this uh, application the, here is very important that they request a, a builder middleware that middleware that is the last one to uh, uh, in in the all slot pipeline that also short circuits the request so if you want to register your own middleware don't register it after this use all slot register it before it because if you register it after uh, they will never be hit so it's, it's, it's uh, very, very important. Uh, and then we have here, uh, as said, everything is basically here in uh, the configuration. So we have this oslot.json uh, file. And as we see here, we have, for instance, uh, configuration here. We have a reroute. 
Uh, and for this reroute, uh, what we can see here is that, okay, we have an upstream path template. So if time a request comes in for API products, uh, of course, on the uh, host name and port of the API gateway, uh, the request will be then uh, basically uh, proxied or redirected to the downstream path template, uh, which will be uh, this uh, HTTPS local host 5003 and slash API slash products. And then we have uh, here uh, the authentication options. Uh, basically, when we create, uh, uh, when we add the authentication mechanism, we add it using a key name. Uh, uh, this key can be whatever we want. Uh, but the importance is that in the rear out, we should use then uh, the, the key that we use to register a specific authentication service or specific, uh, a, a specific uh, identity provider. And it, this is important because it could be that in your application you have more identity providers. And uh, maybe uh, some reroutes you want then to, to use uh, one identity provider for other reroutes you would like to use another. So there is a lot of flexibility here. Uh, then uh, we had this uh, header transformation where we basically uh, take uh, these claims like username and job title uh, from uh, the JOTS token that uh, is received in the header and it puts them uh, as a normal header when the request is sent then uh, to the downstream service. And let's also run this type of application. What I have here is a very, very basic setup with uh, three different services, uh, an authentication service, uh, the API gateway itself. Uh, and we'll see that each service is configured to run on a different port. And I'm not running it on Docker because I have Windows 10 Home on this PC. And, well, you cannot run Docker on Windows 10 Home. So I figured this out only last week. Uh, so we run each service in independently. And we can, if we check here, this is, for instance, uh, the authentication service. And it runs on the port 5002. Uh, then we have this other, uh, um, this is the gateway itself, and this runs uh, on 5001. Uh, then we have this uh, product, which runs on, uh, where is it, uh, 003, and, and so on. And now let's, let's make a request. Uh, I have here Postman, and uh, in Postman, uh, I have already made some, some requests, but we, we can do it once again to see. So what I want to do is here I make a request to, this, uh, uh, to get some users. And uh, the user's uh, service runs, uh, if I remember correct, on 5003. But the request instead I'm making at 5001, which is all slot. So I will send the request and then uh, let's see exactly what, uh, what happens and what we can see in, in the different consoles. So we receive some information about some users, but this is really uh, not important at all. Uh, let's figure out, first of all, uh, this is the API gateway. So we'll see here a lot of logging. Oslot comes with a lot of default logging. Uh, so this is also a, a very good thing. Of course, you can extend that uh, uh, whichever way you would like to do it. And you see that you have here a lot of information. It says that uh, authorization was required, that it was authorized, that the, the rear out uh, uh, was found, and so on. So this is basically all the messages that, uh, that uh, were uh, logged at, uh, at, uh, at Oslot. Uh, and then here this is the user service. And we can see here also a lot of the default logging that we have in ASP.NET Core. But what I also did is I put uh, uh, some code there to extract headers and take the information from the headers and write it uh, in the console. And the headers are basically those that we saw in the reroute that Oslot will take from the JOT token and place it at, as headers uh, when it sends the request to this service. So it means this service here. Uh, so basically, this is, uh, this is uh, how, how it works. So I'm not sure about the time. It's three minutes. OK, um, good. Let's, uh, let's stop the debugging right now. OK, good. So uh, if we go to the user's uh, service, we have this controller here. Uh, and in the controller, uh, we see that it should be the first method in the controller. 
uh, okay, which is this one. And what we do is basically I use the HTTP uh, contest uh, accessor to extract uh, the headers. And uh, I'm using I'm, I'm I want to extract a header uh, that uh, let's uh, let's go to definition here, which is F12. So I basically uh, using uh, okay these are in the field uh, the, 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 these are some some constants so I want to extract the header username and job title. So in the initial request that I sent uh, here, if we go to headers, uh, we see that basically we have the content time uh, type and the authorization. So we don't have any header which a uh, username and and position. So this was basically uh, uh, taken uh, from. Uh, this token that, that we have here, this JOS token. So let me briefly copy it. And uh, let me go to uh, JOS IO. Okay. And, uh, okay. I'm not very good without a mouse. Ah. And let's paste this one. And we see here that we have this username and this job title that uh, is basically on this job token. And Oslot takes this, uh, these claims and adds them, uh, as we showed earlier, uh, to the headers only by having a very, very simple configuration in Oslot. And if we look once again, uh, this is basically the part that does it. So it simply says, okay, we want to add some headers. Uh, look in the claims array. If you, have, you see a header with username, then uh, r use the value to put it to this header and so on. And uh, that's basically how Oslot works and uh, uh, how it could really help us uh, to, uh, uh, to guard basically our services to be a, a central point. And I have to say that we, uh, or uh, the, the team I'm working in, uh, in right now, we are, we are basically building an, uh, such a microservices architecture, and we decided from the beginning to use Oslot. Uh, the application is not 100% uh, in production yet, it's more in testing, uh, but for now, we didn't find any feature functionality that we needed, and that it was not there in Oslot, or that we could not add by ourselves using middleware or dele uh, delegating handlers. So that's why, uh, in my opinion, Oslot is really a very, very powerful library. And uh, I, I guess that also the fact that uh, uh, Microsoft officially backs it and has it in their documentation is also a sign that this is a library that could be used with, uh, uh, I would say, a, f a good amount of success uh, in our projects. So uh, that would be it from, from the presentation. I'm still here for some questions for five minutes. So. Uh, don't be shy and uh, ask. So, um, uh, thanks for this talk. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask uh, where was the uh, mention of uh, service discovery, uh, Ryan, uh, which mm -hmm. could be running in this. Okay. Uh, question is: uh, Is uh, there is some built-in solution for uh, service discovery inside Oslo, or it is planning a very additional code which we could extend? Uh, I, I hope I understood the the, the, the question correctly. It's, cor it's true. Uh, we didn't uh, well. Uh, we didn't have time to go in this topic of service discovery. Uh, service discovery is a feature that is there in, in Oslot, and it is configurable in the global configurations part of the uh, Oslot JSON. And basically, you have to, to, to specify there some, some endpoints that will be available for the discovery, which depending on what deployment mechanism or orchestrator you use, you would need to know, okay, wh what endpoint you have to provide to Oslot for service discovery. And then each time that Oslot will need to make a request, basically it, it will check with that endpoint, okay, uh, where or uh, which is the resource that could fulfill this specific request. But this is uh, something that is 100% functional and uh, you can use it uh, in Oslot. In fact, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put here uh, this uh, uh, last slide. 
uh, because uh, let's go back here uh, basically uh, I put also a link to the Oslot uh, documentation and there uh, all features are really very carefully described there and it explained how uh, how to be configured so did I uh, manage to answer your question or, or not yes you did thanks okay thank you uh, th there is another question right over there <laughs> okay thanks thanks for the presentation uh, just a pretty s possibly stupid question uh, it looks like uh, nginx uh, a little bit could you add some words uh, uh, and explain the difference between uh, Ocelot and uh, Nginx? Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert in uh, Nginx at all, so <laughs> I, 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 I really won't be able to provide this type of information. But the idea is that Ocelot is basically uh, an API gateway that is 100% built on, dot, on .NET Core, and it's uh, very easy to use directly uh, with .NET Core. Uh, while with Engine X, it's a little bit more complicated because it's not a service that is directly created for for uh, .NET Core applications. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask a question: uh, How does the situation with the integration testing <coughs> with that sort looks look like okay. now? And uh, 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 can we use uh, test server class also? Yes, in fact, uh, we can do that. Uh, maybe, I don't know if we have time, but I, if, if I can open my project from, uh, from work, uh, we test the API gateway and we do it like that. We use the test server class, we use the same uh, oslo.json file when we fire up uh, or where we create that web host and it basically then we send requests to it. And, uh, Basically, if uh, if we don't obey to the rules that we have to uh, that we have to use when we send requests, or we do miss the authorization header, or a wrong endpoint, on s or on so on, uh, everything is fully uh, testable. So, is it easy to check, for example, Very transformation easy. of Very features? Easy. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have time for one last question. Um, then that'll be it. I take it as a no, right? So okay. thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. That was super cool.